Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You might notice I'm new here. My name is Melissa Stringer and I'm the lead product manager and consulting and research here at 11FS. Welcome to the 113th episode of 11FS Fintech, uh, Fintech Insider Breakfast Show. And as you know, in this show, we bring you the best and the brightest from around the fintech and banking landscape every single weekday straight to your homes at 8.30 BST, apart from on Mondays and Wednesdays when we go live at 3.30 BST or 10.30 AM Eastern time for our US friends. Both shows go live here on LinkedIn. So today's topic is fintech in South Africa and how Planet 42 are trying to close the mobility gap enforced by financial exclusion. Good morning, Eric, how are you? Doing well, thanks and you. Yes, very well, thank you. And where are you joining us from today? I'm in uh, Cape Town. Oh, awesome, okay. Super. So um, as always, we love getting your uh, questions. So leave them in the comments sidebar and we'll be answering them live for you. So first up, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself, Eric, and what you do at Planet 42. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Planet 42. Um, we're a startup here in South Africa. Uh, originally, both me and the my co-founder Martin are from Estonia, but we moved here to South Africa three years ago to start this this venture. And then what we do is we uh, what we like to say is we democratize access to mobility. So okay. simply simply put, we um, we give cars to people who otherwise would not have it. I see, I see. And so your connection with South Africa, is that um, a family connection or your business partner? How did you come to move to South Africa? Yeah, that's that's totally uh, Martin's fault. So he's the he's like the, the Africa guy and I'm the vehicle, vehicle finance guy. So we've okay. been friends for more than 10 years. And then he had had the idea of starting Planet 42 um, and then convinced me to keep, quit my cozy job back in Europe and then and move to Johannesburg. That sounds great. Better weather, I'm sure. Um, you know, definitely. <laughs> so let's talk about the product you're offering. Um, it's a rent to buy car service, right? Yeah, correct. Okay. So, and so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so just tell us um, what it is, how customers interact with you, um, how they come to rent the cars, and I think there's an option to buy the cars at some time, isn't there? Correct, correct. Uh, so I think the, it's the easiest way to uh, understand is that we're kind of like vehicle finance in some sense, but mm. kind of like a rental company as well, so it's a, it's a hybrid form. Um, we buy cars from second-hand car dealerships. Um, these are used cars, typically more than 10 years old, mm. cost, let's say, between five and 6,000 euros, uh, the equivalent. So we buy these cars and we rent them out to our rent customers uh, who pay us uh, you know, monthly rents. And yeah, they have an option to buy out the car at any time that they wish or just um, return the car if they no longer uh, needed can can afford it uh, or you know some, something else happens. Okay, and we were discussing before that um, this is a super important product actually in South Africa because without you guys, it would be extremely difficult for people to own cars in many instances. Can you talk a little bit about that and uh, this sort of democratization of mobility? That your it's almost like an ethical angle, really, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, we're in a, in a in this, you know it's a good position to have is that you know we're running a you know financially sustainable and, and business uh, that's doing well, but also you know it's 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 doing uh, good for the you know general population in the economy. So this is a it's sometimes a little bit different, difficult to understand. You know, uh, sitting in 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 Europe or or North America. Where it is easy to get, you know, access to uh, financing for it, to buy a car, or really to, to buy anything. So mm -hmm. in South Africa, as in many emerging economies, um, there's a, there's a strong banking system. So, but it, it kind of only serves the top um, percentiles well. So I mean, uh, yeah. So if you have a good credit score, you can easily get vehicle finance. Even me, as as an immigrant, I've, I've gotten. Uh, 
vehicle finance from a local bank and it's it's quite affordable you know and it's it, it works okay however um for let's say 85 to 80 percent of the population they can't get access to finance so mm -hmm. so uh yeah, literally like it isn't that that we're here doing anything um we're not competing with the banks where we are um it's kind of like a blue ocean clientele or strategy for us that uh, we're buying cars for people who otherwise would not have a car at all and, mm -hmm. and again in, in, in emerging markets access to mobility is extremely important because the public transportation is, tends to be you know atrocious so if you don't have have a car you can't get to work you can't get to school you can't you know go grocery shopping so yeah. that's why it's very important to have a car mm. Yeah, it'd be very difficult to to run your life. So how about um, other areas of fintech within South Africa? Are you seeing similar things that sort of um, for the top, maybe 5% of the population and then everybody else um, is underbanked, would you say? Yeah, yeah. So it's not a problem of unbanked. So mm. pretty much everybody has a bank account, um, but they're underbanked, so they're not getting all the all the services. So not everybody has a credit card. Uh, most people can't get uh, car finance, and and, and so. On. Mm. Um, and so, why do you yeah. think that is? Like, why is there this lack of um, competition within the African landscape? Because I think it's it's broader than just South Africa, right? It's kind of Africa generally. Um, so, why do you think this is happening? Um, and what is Planet Forty Two um, doing to move the needle? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, it's very important to, to stress that Africa is a huge continent. So mm. it's it's very different, uh, you know, cultures, even within one country. But it's just, uh, you know, there's, there's many, many differences. So I really can only talk about uh, South Africa specifically. Um, and here we see that, again, the banks aren't really, well, I, I don't, it's not really the bank's fault, I guess. Like, it's just, they've just... Um, they're old and big and tired and slow. Uh, they have low <laughs> like legacy, legacy software and stuff. Yeah. There's regulations are hampering and so on. So it just it, it just makes sense. They can't they can't move quickly. Like mm. for them to issue a loan or a credit product, there's like whatever ten people need to go through. It. There's a credit committee and so on. It, yeah, it makes sense. Like it doesn't make you, you can't make small loans or, mm. or or do like you know take riskier customers rather you just you know you bet on the on the small population as an excellent uh, credit records um, and then you know you, you make money yes but now yeah, increasingly we see like disruption from startups and it's not just you know immigrants like like uh, me coming into uh, into the country there's a there's a really like impressive uh, you know list of African uh, local startups uh, <laughs> who are doing you know you're just doing doing wonderful things you can have like everything from you know uh, ride hailing to uh, neo banks and so on so yeah. there uh, it's it's very much a story of kind of a let's say local champions mm -hmm. also african champions versus this you know uh, a global monopoly dominating everything you know like yes. uber at some point was going going for it that you know we're the biggest one uh, we're going to just take over the market and everybody will just go do ride hailing with uber no it's that's not the case like ride hailing is very local, so that's why you know small upstarts like let's say Bolt from uh, from Estonia can uh, can really you know step on their toes and and, and be profitable as well. Mm. Yeah. So this idea of um, opportunity and um, it comes down to sort of business model as well, and um, I guess your legacy infrastructure to some extent um so i think before we were just having a little chat before the show and you mentioned something really interesting which was around your business model and um i think you know from estonian backgrounds you guys have got a great culture of being really proficient at core um core technology and so um if you can yeah talk a little bit more about that um and the sort of embedded products that you can offer yeah sure so um, both Martin and I for, are from Estonia, which, if you don't know, is, is the land of the unicorns. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, and we're taking advantage of, of the, 
very high quality of tech in uh, in Estonia. So we uh, and, and we do it do it in a way that we don't even hire any any software developers ourselves. So we're buying in um, most of the, like the our core. Let's say even our core system, the way that you know uh, we issue contracts, take payments, and so on. All of that is is bought in. It runs on Estonian uh, technology, mm -hmm. and, and there's a, there's a couple of kind of benefits there. But I think the main thing is that just you know we're we're, we're open about like you know that our core technology is, is outsourced, which means that if there's a better supplier comes along, then we can just uh, shift. So in the same way that we're not um, you know our, our we haven't developed our own spreadsheet software for our, our accountants, we're using Excel. In the same way, we haven't we haven't developed our own core loan management system. So we mm -hmm. take take it off the shelf. It's okay. It's heavily modified for our purposes, but still, um, you know, we're able to kind of uh, forego the, the the really intense development and, and you know resources we need to commit to uh, to develop your own software and use an existing system. So it's a lot. To, I mean, the question really is about you know execution um, and not just um, uh you know the, the idea so the business idea obviously needs to be good as well but but this isn't a monopolistic market it's financial services right now yeah we're the only you know game in town but we're we're pretty sure that there that there will be competition quite soon mm -hmm. and and at that point it will be you know what it only sets you apart is ex execution like yes your customer doesn't care how cool your technology is it just needs to work <laughs> Very true. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. So because of the way that you've um, built Planet 42, you would be able to substitute an existing provider for something new if something better came along and ultimately your uh, your customers would benefit. Um, and I think that we can see that with your existing partnerships at the moment. So um, I note that you've got um, insurance included in all of your car rentals which um, obviously from the customer's point of view is um, probably a great reassurance um, so is that um, is is that a local partner or an international partner and um, are they a, a fintech company like you well it depends who you ask i think uh, increasingly like everybody thinks that they're a fintech so you know, <laughs> I, sure i guess they're in a fintech but uh, so currently we're using, and in this is, um, we're not trying to keep it secret. So every one of our cars is comprehensive insured. So it's not just third party insurance, it's, it's comprehensive insurance. Um, so if, you know, I don't know, you, you drive your car into something yourself, then your insurance covers it. Our insurance partner right now is King Price, which is one of the largest uh, insurance providers in, in South Africa. However, before them, we used, I think ace and before that it was some something else so it's kind of in the same logic uh, that we're you know it, it's pretty it's a commodity i mean mm. honestly like insurance is, is a commodity uh in the same way that our you know our customers don't really care how the system works as long as it works but the same same way for us it doesn't really matter that much what is the brand that is offering the the insurance what it, what matters is what what terms do they offer and how much does it cost so again, we, we've we've changed insurance providers in the past. I expect to do it in the, in the future, just to you know uh, to to get like the whatever the best offer is, we can go for it, mm. and then we can easily just replace it uh, on, our, on our our system, because again, we don't have kind of like legacy stuff. So yeah, like you know, we can't we can't change from this this provider because you know we we've integrated with them. Mm. like whatever 20 years ago when the guy who integrated it has died so therefore we can't change it anymore so yes we're not kind of we're not bogged down by, by things like that mm. yeah your ability to um adapt to change and to provide the best service to your customers is um definitely coming through um so another another a build on that though is how you guys handled um, the COVID-19 crisis because I think you offered some special relief to your clients whereas um, potentially the rest of the market was a little bit more aggressive with their strategy. Could you talk a bit about that? Yeah sure I think in South Africa as in I think most places, places in the world it was a big kind of push for like, different types of payment relief. Mm. So obviously, a lot of a lot of people lost their incomes, even if temporarily, and were struggling to make payments. So, 
to banks and then others, other financial service providers moved quickly to, or tried to move quickly at least, to offer payment relief. Uh, this is just uh, it was reported by Bloomberg a couple of weeks back. Uh, in South Africa, this result, like this payment relief that banks offered, uh, resulted in more than one billion dollars of extra uh, debt indebtedness. So basically, uh, whatever the payment relief uh, was offered to the customers, it was just added on top of their principal, and now everybody owes more to the banks, and their actually future payments are higher. So, I mean, it's, it doesn't really sound like payment uh, relief to me. But again, I understand why the banks did it. Like that's like their business models can't really take like this, uh, you know, increased uh, increased uh, delinquency basically. Uh, so there's not like much margin there. So th 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 they, they don't really have they don't really have a lot of wiggle room. So for us, what we did is uh, we started offering what we called solidarity payments. Mm -hmm. uh, in the first solidarity payments, I think yeah, we did it in, uh, did those in, in March. Which basically meant that we incentivized customers to pay us even even half of their rental, and then if they couldn't do that, then we basically started paying for them. Because when we saw that the customer actually this is it seems to be a temporary issue, that they're likely to recover payments, we said okay, fine, like you don't have to pay for one month or two months, so that uh, you know once you you know regain employment, you still, your, your your income recovers, then you can also start paying us again. So these kind of um, an interesting thing thing there is that if you so the concept of solidarity payments, we thought about it like we discussed it with the team in uh, second half of uh, March. Let's say that was on a Monday uh, that we first thought of it. On a Tuesday, our customer service started to offer these uh, uh, these solidarity payments, but we didn't actually have the development live yet. So then we went to our Estonian developers like hey like we're offering this thing for our customers but we don't have a way yet to actually you know affect these payments into the system mm. so we need to like develop something quickly like they got those guys did it in like two days or something wow um and then and we were we were able to like very quickly then uh, start you know providing actual relief relief to customers uh and then we've yeah we've uh, we've done so for hundreds of customers by, by mm. now and we, we and this is actually just a kind of covid pushed us into that to, to, to develop something like that, but now we're seeing like this this kind of functionality makes sense and also kind of let's say normal times. Yes. Um, because they're, they're, it's easier, like, it's completely possible. A customer's paid, you know, I don't know, has been a customer for you like I don't know, ten months, always pays on time, and now is just struggling. Okay, fine, you don't have to pay for a month. Uh, let's, you know, it, that that's better than you know defaulting, bringing back the car, you know, all the costs in, involved in that, rather just you know keep the car and then once you once you're able again you start paying yeah absolutely keeping the uh, relationship intact as well and um you know protecting the customer from having um more financial exclusion potentially through um you know bad uh, credit rating and uh, worsening situation i think that these things can spiral so um the yeah the work and the response that you guys have done is really admirable actually um in this area so I've got a question uh, from Dan Feehany, if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and it's all about um, how you guys assess credit, which is a great question. And um, so how does Planet 42 um, credit assess? Right. So uh, when we first started off, then we didn't really have a data set to really build any algorithms on. So luckily, in South Africa is a pretty good infrastructure in terms of yeah, you know just the, the credit ratings and so the credit bureaus the system kind of works like the data isn't always reliable but mm. there's lots of it and you know you have credit scores and things so we started off very very basically just you know looked at mainly the, the generic credit score uh, and basically had to pull the trigger just like okay let's see let's see what happens at some point so when we if we would have believed our kind of advisors uh, in, in South Africa, then you know, saying like you know, buying buying secondhand cars to people who banks don't want to finance, that just seems like a recipe for disaster. Um, but you know, it, it's worked out really well. Um, so the and then you know, we we launched more than two years ago. So by now we've we've issued more than two thousand contracts. Mm -hmm. That's enough 
data to build your own credit score on. So we've now, since the end of last year, we're running on our on our own credit score that we update every uh, every couple of months with you know new data comes in. Uh, and yeah, so the system's actually really easy. So the application is submitted, and you know within one minute uh, there will be a you know decision whether or not to make an offer to this customer or not. Obviously, we we validate you know income and, and other documents in, in the next phase, but in, in principle, you know the offer that we the, the initial offer that we can make that that basically sticks, and then you know we can do that in in, in one minute uh, if the application is submitted in the middle of the night. It's it's all automated, so mm. um, yeah, we, we can we can take apps from there. And do you see the most um, applications coming from city areas or um, are most of your customers in rural areas? And how do you think that might change in the future? Yeah, so they are, well, just to answer it uh, from city areas, more apps coming from city areas, but that's because, you know, we, we've started off from the city. So the, the way, you know, we, we have no physical infrastructure. So we don't see the customer that we buy the car for, and we don't see the car that we buy. Instead, what we do is we sign up dealerships across the country. And we started off in, in Joburg, and um, now we're also in Cape Town going to Durban and so on, just kind of, um, you know, add, adding other, other, uh, other cities or dealerships from, from other cities. So that's where the applications come from. But at the same time, you know, uh, it's, I th it's pretty much the same for every, uh, you know, every country, like, Obviously, people in the countryside also need cars, but not not every small town has a dealership. So, if people need a car, they will go to the go to the city uh, to buy a car. And quite a high number of our customers actually are from rural areas. If you, if you look at their you know uh, postcodes and, and addresses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, in the future, where are you hoping to take Planet Forty Two? Is there um, a divergence in the products you want to offer? Is it just to grow generally? What's your plan? So, right now, the focus is on on growth. In South Africa, we have a very capable local team. Mm -hmm. We're essentially running the South African side of the business, you know, day to day operations on their own. Uh, that's our uh, team in Joburg. I think they're watching as well. So, you know. Hi guys. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm 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 based in Cape Town. Uh, Martin currently is back in back in Estonia, and we as the founders are more focused on you know strategic st strategic plans now. So what is the next country we go to? Uh, where do we raise money from, and, and so on? Mm. Uh, this problem is not unique to South Africa. Uh, we want to. We want to take the next big market soon. COVID has kind of put a dent in those plans. We wanted to open uh, already in 2020. It doesn't look likely anymore, but we're going to go for big emerging markets. So, you know, Southeast Asia and, and, and Latin America, are the next kind of big, big targets there. And it's mainly going to be the similar product. So mm -hmm. enabling people who currently don't have access to a vehicle to, to kind of take the risk on them and then you know, uh, get, get them into a car or a motorcycle. Or something. Mm -hmm. And so in these uh, emerging markets that you'd uh, like to take your product into, what would be the plan? Would you have a team on the ground that would help you with uh, local relationships? How would that work? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's all local. So mm -hmm. exactly like uh, the South, Afri South Africans are running the South African business. Yeah. You're gonna have the same, you know, in. in Indonesia or Brazil or something like that. Obviously, you know, we're, we're there to, to support and then there's like kind of, let's say, some HQ functions or group functions that need to be provided from some kind of a central location. But, you know, the business in the, in the local country needs to be run from there. So obviously, you know, it doesn't, doesn't mean that everybody has to be like the same nationality in that country, but you can't really run a business like that from you know an ivory tower in new york or something yeah absolutely um and so in terms of these um these markets though why why would your product not work in um like a new york or a london because i don't think everybody has necessarily access to um you know big purchases here either and uh, is it just that the market is more competitive 
Well, yeah, but but it's so the problems isn't large enough there, and then like there there are different providers uh, in in New York, and I, perhaps maybe like the, the best example here is so before I launched this company uh, with my co-founder, I was uh, working for Mogo Finance, which is actually one of the fastest growing companies in, in Europe, and they're doing a pretty much a similar thing. So it's kind of like vehicle finance. Mm, for for used cars, mm. but in and this we'll come back to what we said in the beginning is that the the fintech and the financial services in 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 Europe and uh, uh, North, Northern America is basically it's to doing the, offering the same service a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, so in uh, in Mogo, I, I was my my work enabled people to get a fancier car than they otherwise would have. They would have had a car. But now they got a fancier one. I see. Whereas, whereas in here, the, our customers would not have a car if we would not be in this business. So yeah. that's kind of like a, you know, and you know that's where that's how we can actually have a huge impact, uh, like you know, on on the, on the markets that we're in. Whereas just kind of you know being a convenience, a nice to have, nice to have service. So that's that's something that you know motivates us. Yeah, totally. Well, that is amazing. And I think that you guys are already having tremendous impact. So wish you all the best in the future. OK, everybody, I think that we're coming to the top of the hour and I'm sure that you've all got days to get to. So thank you so much for joining me, Eric. Uh, where can people find out more about you? Uh, right here on LinkedIn or, or Twitter. I'm easy to easy to find uh, Eric Oya. OK. Super. Uh, right. That's all we've got time for today. Um, tomorrow, I won't be here, but Sam Mool, um, our US colleague, will be joined by Josh Slifers from uh, Novice Pay on the US show at 3.30 BST or 10.30 AM Eastern time. So have a great day, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Melissa.